Hello, and welcome to a digital statistics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we're going to be going through section 3.1 for Math 1040, Measures of Central Tendency. I uh, will also note that this is going to be one of the longer chapters, at least uh, so far. Chapter 1 had the same amount of sections, had five sections as well, but it's, I don't think it's technically as long as 3 is, where we're going to be talking about a lot more data collection and data entry. Uh, you'll also note that on the right side here, I have my calculator with three lists inputted. List 1 and List 2 are coming from the two data sets on the bottom of page 2 of the lecture notes. You'll see one data set uh, labeled as traditional, another data set labeled as flipped. Each of them have 13 values in them, and I have those in List 1 and List 2. List 3 is coming from page 3. At the top, you'll see 25 numbers that range from 0 to 40. I highly recommend having these data sets in your calculator already like I do here because we are going to be using and calculating with them. And having those prepared moving into this lecture will help you a lot. Um, if you have issues with data entry and you haven't done it too much, I highly recommend either checking out my previous lectures on Chapter 2 where we start data entry or you can see my dedicated video for data entry and manipulation for lists. Um, in my calculator tutorial. I believe it is called List Manipulation for the TI-83 and 84 calculator. Okay, uh, otherwise we're going to move on with these values in our lists. For section 3.1 we'll be discussing measures of central tendency. And what that means is that we're going to be talking about how to describe the middle of your data set. Particularly how to describe the middle of a numeric data set, so quantitative data sets. Um, there are multiple different ways of describing the center, however the most common ones are what is typically referred to as the three M's. The first of those M's is the mean, which is probably the one you may be more familiar with uh, by its other name, which is an average. The mean is the same thing as an average, so if you're familiar with how to find the average of some data values, then this should be a lot easier to go on. We call it the arithmetic average because there are different types of averages and this is the one that we are looking for. And to find an arithmetic average, we will follow a simple two-step process. You add up all the data values and then you divide by the number of the data values. The formulas for which follow this trend, the first formula we have is for the population mean. You'll notice that the population mean starts off with this letter here. It looks like a U with a little bit of a growth on the left side. This is the Greek letter mu. So you will hear me say the word mu quite often. For a sample mean, we start off with a different character. We start off instead with that uh, character, which we literally call X bar. On the right side of both these equations are very similar looking values. Here for the population mean we have the top that says sigma x sub i. What this means in mathematical shorthand is sum up all the individual x values. You may be familiar with that letter maybe from Excel. This just means sum everything in front of it. So the top is sum all the values and then divide by capital N. Whereas for a sample, it has the same top, you sum all the individual values, but instead you divide by a lowercase n. So those capital and lowercase n's are the important part here to grab onto these equations. For population, we have capital N and sample we have little n. If you recall from the first chapter, we talked about that for notation for samples and populations, we use little n to to denote the sample size, whereas we use capital N to denote the population size. Overall then, that means that these equations are mostly identical, and to calculate the population or sample mean is the same thing. The only difference there is the labeling. So the equations here are exactly the same. The, ma the main important point though is how we label it. For population we label it as mu, for sample we label it as x bar. Those labels are going to be very important for us. Sometimes the description of the problem we have will identify something as a population or sample, and we need to identify it as such, or it will simply give us that mu equals 10 or x bar equals 10. Whichever one it gives us, that tells us what kind of data set we are working with, which, although it doesn't influence the calculation of the mean, it will influence a lot of other calculations moving on, starting with section 3.2. 
So having that accurate labeling is going to be very important for us. Generally, if you don't know something is a population or a sample, it's usually in best interest to assume that it's a sample. Um, it's safer that way, particularly for calculations later on down the line. For example, down here, we have this short example of five numbers, three, five, two, six, and three. If you add up all five of these, you get a sum of 19. Three plus five is eight, plus two is 10, plus six is 16, plus three is 19. Those five numbers means n is five, and doesn't say if it was a sample or, or population, but we'll assume that it's a sample because we don't have enough information. So we'll label it as x bar equals 19 over five, otherwise known as 3.8 if you divide those. So that's how you would find a sample mean by hand. On the left side of this page, you have advantages and disadvantages. And I'll get to that one in just a moment after I talk about the rest of these uh, definitions. For the second way of describing the center, we could also describe the center using our second M, known as a median. The median represents the middle value. That's the word that you always want to associate with the median. It's the number in the middle that lies in a data set that is in order or in ascending order. That's also very important. It's not necessarily just going to be the middle of the data that's given to you. It has to be in numerical order for us to try to describe what the middle number is. So that means that when you're calculating it, the three-step process is that you sort the data, find it in numerical order first, then you count from either the ends, uh, count from the ends to the middle of the list. So you could count uh, using just the beginning or what a lot of people do is they list the numbers so like a b c d e f g they would list all the numbers whatever these numbers would be and they start crossing off one by one from both the left and the right until they reach the middle value now depending on the data set there might just be one number in the middle or there could be no defined number in the middle, in which case the middle number should lie in the middle of these two values that are in the center. Um, we have examples of both of those down here. If you have the data set 34263, three, note that I'm not going to just then say, all right, well, the middle number is two, so that's the median. I first need to put that in order, which we do right here, two, three, three, four, and six. And then we identify the middle value, it says th four here, this should be a three. Three is the middle value of this data set. If I have a larger data set, uh, three, four, two, six, three, seven, which means it added another number. Well, then when I go to order them, two, three, three, four, six, seven, if I start to try to cross off both on the left and the right until I get to a middle number, I don't really get to a middle number. There, there's nothing here, so there's a blank. What that then means is that I take the two middle ones, so three and four, and I find the average of them, three plus four divided by two, I find the average or the mean, and that gives me 3.5, which is what we would indicate as the median of that data set. So, that's how you would find the median if it's either a odd or an even uh, sized data set. Now, there are going to be ways that we are going to be calculating this as well, but it's good to understand where both these come from. Now, now I, I want to go through the advantages and disadvantages of both the mean and the median, because these are the primary two modes of representing the center of the data set. For a mean, it has an advantage, I, I won't write these down because I don't have as much space here and the typing's not that great. Um, the main advantage of the mean is that it uses all the numbers in the data set. So the main advantage is that it uses all the numbers in the data set, which sounds kind of basic. It sounds kind of self-explanatory that, well, if you want to describe the data, it makes sense to use all the data. Yes, that is true, but some of the other uh, values don't use all of the data, and you'll see in just a moment what I mean. The main disadvantage of the mean is that it is not what we call resistant. It is not resistant. 
Now that term is the term that's right below the median where resistance describes extreme values that uh, uh, having resistance means that extreme values do not affect the value of the mean, median, whatever numerical summary we're trying to use. Well, the mean is not resistant. And what that means in context, well, if I have the numbers one, uh, let's say I have just a small data set of one, two, and three. Well, if that's my data set, if I find my mean x bar, that would be one plus two plus three is six, divided by three gives me two. Nice and simple. Two represents this data pretty well. Well, what if I expanded on this data set? What if I had one, two, three, and I had a thousand? Just a very extreme number. Well, now if I add all these up, if I do x bar equals add all this up, I'll get 1006 divided by now 4. And if I do 1006 divided by 4, what I get is 251.5. Yeah. Well, 2 described that previous data set pretty well. But 251.5 doesn't describe this data set much at all. Most of the numbers are really, really small, with that one exception being very large. And this 251 got dragged up by that 1,000. I try to think about it like a tug-of-war match. If you have extreme values like this, either high values like this or really low values, that can pull the mean in that direction, which is very dangerous. So even though the advantage is that it uses all values in the data set. Even though that's one of its primary advantages, that also leads to its primary disadvantage, is that it is not resistant. Now, on the other hand, for medians, the main advantage of the median is that it is resistant. So it is resistant. Also, in parentheses, I'll say it tends to be easier. It takes less mathematical computation to find the median. Now, it is resistant because extreme values don't influence it too much. For example, we did two ex uh, situations down here finding the median where we had 3, 2, 4, 6, 3, and we found a median of 3. And then we added a new number to it. Well, what if instead of this number 7 that we added, what if I added the number 7,000? Well, then this would be ordered as 2, 3, 3, 4, 6, 7,000. Well, that wouldn't really matter. The, the middle two values are still 3 and 4. So even though I added a new value and the median changed from a 3 to a 3.5, it didn't change that much it's more resistant to these extreme values than the mean is, which is a very good thing about it. However, the disadvantage it has is basically means advantage. The mean cared about every single number because in the previous data set of one, two, three, and a thousand, it cared about the value of all of those numbers and used every number available to make the mean. Whereas the median doesn't do that. The median only cares about the one or two numbers in the middle of the data set. So it only uses a small amount of the available data. It only uses a small portion of that data, either one or maybe two numbers. That kind of sucks. If you have a data set of 1,000 or 2,000 numbers and you gather that from 1,000 or 2,000 individuals, well, then most of those individuals don't matter. Of the 1,000, I only care about one or two of those 1,000 individuals, just the ones that happen to be in the middle. We typically want everybody's voice and all data to matter and to have importance to your calculations. So that's a huge downside of the median. However, there are going to be ways of kind of uh, approaching that downside or dealing with that 
and we'll discuss that at the end of chapter 3. Okay, however, the mean and the median are going to be our primary two ways of calculating the center. A third one, which is the third M, is mode. And notice that we don't have much here, and that's because you don't use the mode very often. The mode simply means the most frequent observation. And what it really means is the number that is repeated the most often. So, for example, when I have these numbers here, 3, 4, 2, 6, 3, which value is repeated the most in this? Well, 3 is repeated twice. Since it shows up the most, it's repeated the most, then that means the value is 3. Notice the important question is which one is repeated the most. For the second one, this is 63263, I have 6 repeated twice, and I also have 3 repeated twice, which means there's a tie. Thus, that means that there are two modes. When you're calculating a mode, you'll either have one mode, either the one that's repeated the most, you'll have a tie between one or more modes, or you could have no modes at all. If I had a data set of 1, 2, 3, and 4, of this data set, the number that's repeated the most often is not available because there is no number that's repeated at, uh, the most. Since there is no number repeated, then that means there is likewise no mode. So for the question of a mode, you could also have no mode in a data set if there are no numbers repeated. Okay, now it's not used that often because, again, it doesn't really matter as much which one is repeated the most, particularly when you have larger and larger data sets. What tends to matter more often is the mean and the median. However, the mode can come in more often, and you tend to see the mode show up in other terminology, such as what we'll eventually call bimodal data. So, small note, but just make sure you can identify the mode in a data set. Now, when you're comparing the mean and the median, the shape of the data, which we talked about before, the skew of the data, can influence or imply how the mean and the median uh, associate with each other. Just knowing the shape of the data should tell you how the mean and the median interact. Likewise, if you know the value of the mean and the median, you thus should be able to describe what the shape of the data is. If you have symmetric data, which looks like this, this uh, bell curve kind of shape, then that means the mean and the median are both going to show up near the center of this. I'll use, I'll use black for mean, and I'll use blue for the median. So that's where the mean would be. The median would also likewise be pretty close to the center. So when describing the mean and the median for symmetric data, they are approximately equal to each other. I don't like to say strictly equal because I don't want you to have that misconception that if they're not exact, then that means it's skewed. If they're pretty close, depending on the data set, then that could imply that they're approximately equal. Now that does also matter how much the data spreads. So if you have numbers that spread thousands of data sets wide or data values wide, um, then them being within one, two, or even 10 values could still imply symmetry. Uh, whereas if you have data that's more congested, maybe all you have a thousand numbers all in the 50s, then that means the mean and the median should be really close to each other for us to imply symmetry here. But they should be approximately equal to uh, compare symmetric data. If you have left skewed data, that means the data is skewed to the left, you have this rat tail, then that also means that the mean is going to be pulled in that direction. It's a good phrase to get down and understand with skew, is that the mean is pulled in the direction of the skew. That phrase will help you a lot with understanding where the mean should be for skewed data. Since it is left skewed, that means in my tug of war, the mean is going to be pulled in that direction. So instead of being near the uh, top here, maybe the mean is a little bit pulled down, away from the top of that hill of the data set. Now, that's because the mean is not resistant. Uh, the mean is very influenced by those extreme values. The median, though, 
is resistant, but that doesn't mean that it's not influenced at all. It is just more resistant than the mean is. So the median does tend to be near the center of this data, maybe pulled a little bit, but not by much at all. What that then means is that the mean is below the median. I'll use, I was using uh, mu there, let's use x bar for mean, x bar and m. Um, that means the mean is below the median, so we would say that the mean is less than the median. For right skew to be the exact opposite, the median would still be close to the center, whereas the mean is pulled over to the right towards the skew. Thus, we would say that the mean is greater than the median. So a greater than symbol. All right. Now, other ways of thinking about this, particularly with symbols, um, the way we read this is mean is less than the median. Whereas the, this one we would read as the mean is greater than the median. Well, that's because when you have left skew, I'll highlight this, when you have left skewed data, then that means it is less. The mean is less than the median. If you have right skewed data, that means the mean is greater than the median. So there's a lot of different ways to try to get this down initially. But trust me, the more you work with this, the more you'll be able to recognize it uh, more easily. Okay, but that's how you would compare the mean and the median. So we've shown how to describe the center with mean and median. We've done a couple of really small examples, but those small data sets are very rare uh, in actual statistics. Most data sets use at least 30 values, typically more. Um, that means it, it tends to be pretty uh, illogical to do it all by hand nowadays because data sets are so large and it would just take way too much time. In order to make this easier on us, we are going to work with our calculator from now on to calculate the mean and the median. And to do that, we're going to be using a function called OneVerStats. The description for how to get to OneVerStats is available in this printout here, but I will use the next example to show you how to do it in this video. All right, for this exercise, exam scores in the stats class taught using traditional lecture and the class taught using flip classroom model were recorded. The flip classroom is one where the content is delivered via video and watched at home, which is probably kind of familiar to you right now, uh, while class time is used for activities and exploration. First, A, determine the mean and median score for each class and comment on any differences. All right, so we have data sets for the traditional and flipped classroom. Notice these are split data sets, so I'm going to keep them separate. I have traditional as list one, and I've flipped as list two in my data. A couple other things. Um, looking at the description, it says exam scores in a stats class taught dur during traditional lecture. Um, it doesn't really say that these are necessarily samples. It doesn't say that these are necessarily populations. Um, I still say that it's a sample just because it's not as clear, although the way that it's implied makes it look more like a population than anything else. Um, but I am going to calculate for both of these. All right, for the traditional, we're going to calculate the mean. I'll indicate that as X bar. And then I'm also going to calculate the median. I'm going to do the same thing for flipped. All right, first I'll show you how to do it for traditional, and then I recommend pausing and trying it for flipped on your own. All right, so traditional, I have these 13 values in list one. Once you have these in list one, we're going to go access one ver stats. Stats is going to be in the stats section of your calculator where you got the list themselves. We're gonna hit stats and then we're going to, instead of going into edit, we're gonna go into the second tab over, which stands for calculate. We're gonna do that by just hitting to the right. The first option there is one ver stats. One ver stats means one variable statistics. It means that we're going to be taking a single variable, in this case, scores for a traditional classroom, and we're going to be calculating statistics on that. Uh, note that the second option, two ver stats, that's for two variable statistics, we will actually never use that one in this class. Even later on where we have frequency lists, just don't ever use two ver stats and don't be tempted to do so. So never use that second option. It'll always be one ver stats to calculate most basic statistics. Now for most TI calculators, you see this, 
with one very stats, it asks you for a list and a FREQ list. If you do not see this, I will get to you in just a second. Um, for our purpose here, we just want to calculate tr the traditional, so I have list one here already. If you need to change that, all you need to do is notice that above the numbers one, two, three in your calculator, you'll see in blue or orange or yellow, depending on the calculator model, you see L1, L2, and L3 printed on the backboard of the calculator itself. To access that, I would hit second one to get list one. Or second two to get list two, or second three to get list three. I hit enter to lock that in. Frequency list, I don't have one. We will have some later on in this chapter, but for now we don't have any. And I don't need to put anything there. I'm just going to leave that blank. So I just hit enter to get through it. Make sure there's nothing there. If there is anything there, make sure you delete that out. And then calculate and you should get your mean. Now for those that didn't see that screen, what you most likely saw was this. Was one var stats with a cursor on the main screen. With this, it's going to uh, assume that you know that it wants two inputs, or at least one input. In order to do one stats this way, you just need to have one stats printed like you do, and then just hit second one to make list one show up like that. So that way your calculator should read one stats L1. For now, that's all you need. Hit enter, and you're good. So whichever calculator model you have, that should have covered it. Uh, on this data set, we have the top X bar. That's going to be our mean. Awesome. We have that. So 71.82 approximately. I'll do two decimal places. So 71.82. This one doesn't really exactly say where to round. Uh, I usually like to do at least two decimal places, usually around three or four. Um, but this is good enough for our purposes in this case. The other values here, like sigma x, sigma x squared, you won't need to worry about those. Those are for if you needed to calculate the mean again by hand or wanted to show more uh, exact work. Um, and we'll talk about more of this data, uh, these symbols later on, like what sx and this little o means. You'll also note, though, that n equals 13. We know n. Little n is supposed to be your sample size, and that's saying it's 13. Also note that because it says little n and also the top said x bar, it's always going to assume that it's a sample. It's never going to assume that it's a population. And for us, that's fine, because the sample mean and population mean calculations are exactly the same. So you won't ever see one various stats print out with, X, uh, with uh, mu instead of x bar, or capital N instead of lowercase n. Just know that you have to look at the information of the data, the information given, to see if it's supposed to be a population or a sample, and label it appropriately. Unfortunately, though, we don't see a, a label for a median here, which is usually a capital M or something. Um, however, I do see a down arrow. Now, as long as you haven't typed anything in, you should be able to move down this by literally hitting down on the arrow key, and you should get more information. Again, most of this we don't uh, know or need yet, but we do need that third to last one, MED, which stands for a median. And that's going to be 70.8. All right, now in terms of differences, 71.82, 70.8, they are about one point off from each other, and the mean is slightly greater than the median. What that implies then is that because the mean is greater than the median, we would maybe think that it's slightly skewed right, since the mean is greater. Or, these values aren't too far off, particularly when I look at what the smallest data value is and the largest data value is it is from 56 to 85 that spreads pretty far with that in mind and my data values only being one number off i would maybe think that this data is roughly symmetrical or uh, roughly bell-shaped but that's how we can try to describe the data without even looking at a picture of it just that simple mean and median those two values to, cent to describe the center tend to be a lot um, even for small or large data sets now, if you haven't already, I want you to try the flip data set in list two on your own. Pause the video, see how you do. I'm going to move on from here now and, and show to see, uh, how to get the flipped data. Okay, so uh, the flip data, again, I have that, just checking, stat, edit. I have that in list two here, 63.4 up to 91.8. 
Uh, you should note that the last number that you plug in should say L2 parentheses 13. That's implying you typed in 13 numbers. Um, then we want to hit one very stats. Um, I can do one very stats from anywhere. I did it before from the list screen. I will show you that I could do it from the main screen as well. It does not matter where you are. Go into stat, calculate, then run one bear stats. In this case, we want list two. So what we're going to do is hit second two to get L2 there for my list. And that's all we need. We do not have a frequency list, which is what FREQ stands for. We do not have a frequency list yet, so we're going to leave that blank. If you did not have the wizard, you had this screen, one bear stats with a cursor. Simply do second two to get L2 so that this program is going to analyze list two, our flipped data, and then hit enter. So our mean is the top, 77 point, we rounded to two decimal places before, so I'll do 0.48. And then to get to my median, remember, I need to scroll down, and we find a median of 76.8. All right, so we have the mean and the median there. Notice that these, this mean and, me, mean and median are even closer to one another. Um, these aren't even one full data value off or one full point off from each other. They're only, what, point, uh, six from off from each other, roughly? 0.68 from, uh, off from each other? So pretty close. Um, so I would still probably say roughly symmetrical. However, comparing the differences between the data sets, we see that traditional has a mean and median down close to 70 and 71, whereas flipped has a mean and median down or up above in 76 and 78. So that would imply that the mean or the average ha is higher for the flipped classroom than it is for the traditional classroom. Nice. So we can compare these data sets just by looking at one numerical summary, which is really nice. Now, the last one, last part here, B says, suppose the score of 85.3 in the traditional course, which is the one I have circled right here, um, was incorrectly recorded as 853. We call this data entry error. How would this affect the mean and the median? Well, without even calculating it, I should have an idea of what's going to happen. If this 85.3 was instead 853, we identify that as a very extreme number that's higher than the rest of the data set. Likewise, what that means is that it's likewise going to pull the mean a lot higher than its current position of 71.82. So, we would say here that the value of the mean would increase due to the mean not being resistant. To the extreme value. However, the median, on the other hand, is very resistant. So even if that 85.3 was 853, the position of the center value would not change. So the median would not be affected as much by the extreme value. And actually, in this case, the median is not going to change at all because we are simply replacing a high number. If we added a new number to this, like we kept the original data set and then added a number, another number of 1,000 or something, then that might shift over the median slightly because, again, extreme values can slightly influence the median, just not as much. Um, but since we're replacing, we still have the same amount of data, so the median is still in the same place. There should be no change. And what this property is showing is resistance. So this is showing the property of resistance. Now, I did this without even calculating anything, because we should know how the mean and median interact with high values. We can test this, though. So I'm going to go back in my data set. Uh, my traditional data set was list 1, and I'm going to scroll down to the bottom to 85.3, and I'm going to highlight over that and write over it as 853. 
this is a very common mistake. Um, and this happens a lot. So if you see a mean and median that doesn't necessarily look right for data, like 71 and 78 makes sense for this data set, then maybe go back and check to see if you did commit any data entry error. If I run one ver stats on that quote unquote new data set with the incorrect value of 853, if I run that now, I get a mean of 130.86. So the new mean is 130.87, uh, I guess, 130.87. That has changed significantly from 71.82. It has jumped by 60 values. And this is what I mean by checking just visually does the mean make sense. All of my values were between 56 and 85. How did the mean become a number, another number that's outside of that data set? It should be somewhere in that data set. So that's what I mean by it not making sense. However, the median, if I scroll down, the median is still 70.8. No change at all. So that's showing the property of resistance. Okay, so we have a few more examples. We have page three and page four here. On page three, we have hours working. A random sample 25 college students were asked, how many hours per week do you typically work outside of home? Their responses are as follows. Uh, these 25 values I have in list three. We are going to be using this at least for a little bit. So I have these values in list three. Um, now, to help with this, this data set has already been compiled into a frequency list and shown as a frequency histogram um, for your viewing pleasure. And there should be a zero here probably. Um, here the class widths are width of 5, and we have the frequencies on the left side with the histogram, and a very nicely labeled one at that. Now looking at this histogram, we see the top of the hill over here, so if I were to draw a curve, I see the top of the hill over here, and then I see a skew down towards the left side. Now because I see a skew down towards the left side, that means the mean is likewise less than the median. Remember, left skew implies that the mean is less than the median. So mu is less than the median. So left means less. So we say that the mean is less than the median. In terms of y, we would say the mean is not very resistant to the extreme values that are located in the left skew of this data set. Something like that. Um, now, you don't need to use my exact words, but just trying to describe the, the fact that we have these values over here that are pulling the mean down away from the center of the data. If you even imagine if this part didn't exist, if, come on, there we go. Um, if this part didn't exist at all, and I only had this part of the data, this data would look not exactly symmetrical, but not far off. And I'd expect both the mean and the median to be pretty centralized in the middle of this data set. But, unfortunately, we don't have that. We have this data set that is being pulled, or the mean that is being pulled, down towards the left side. Now, it does ask us to find the mean and the median to show this, and that's why I have the data set in list 3. Again, go ahead and try this on your own. Um, and we're going to say, which measure of central tendency better describes the data? Well, if I do stat, go over to calculate one bear stats. Remember, you could be anywhere when you pull this up. I want to run this on list three, so I do second three. And no frequency list. Remember, if you just have one bear stats on the main screen, just do L3 and you're good. Hit enter to run that. We find a mean, uh, which let's actually check the description here um okay this says random sample right there that's all i need to know so that means that this actually should have been an x bar 
Likewise, I'm going to say, all right, this is x bar equals 26.64. And then if I go my calculator and I scroll down, I find a median of 30. This verifies what I thought because 26.64 is indeed less than 30. That is true, so that verifies what I thought would happen based on just the shape of the data. All right, now the second part of this says, which measure of central tendency better describes the hours? Well, the key is to look at the shape of the data. If you have data that is symmetric, which is hopefully a lot of the data we want to work with, if you have data that is symmetric, then the mean is better. However, in this case, since the data set is skewed left, we would use the median to better represent the data. And that is true whether it was skewed left or skewed right. If you have skew, then that means that you have extreme values that is pulling the mean either towards the left or the right. We don't want that. If we have those extreme values and it's pulling the mean, that means the mean is not as good anymore to represent the majority of the data. Even looking at my data set here, 30, if I identify 30, I'll do uh, with green, 30 would put the median right here. That's where the median would be. Whereas 26.64 would put, not even there, probably further out even, uh, would put the mean around here. That does not describe the majority of the data too well. We want it to really describe the data that's surrounding it. This is not the majority of the data. Whereas if I have the median, the data surrounding that, that's pretty good. That does encapsulate a good majority of the data. And it's not as influenced by these extreme values down here. So because it's skewed, the median is better. And that will always be true. All right. Now we're almost done. We have a couple more on page four. Uh, in this case, this is a large data set, but I don't ask you to put this in your calculator because this is a little bit long. Um, and we already have the data represented for us as a frequency list. So we have data that represents the weights in grams for a simple random sample of m &M candies. In this case, we have 50 values. Um, and we have the shape and the frequency list already here. Uh, from the shape of the distribution of weights of m &M candies, which measure of central tendency better describes the weight? Well, let's look at that. If I, if I look at this data set, either by looking at the frequency list or by looking at the graph itself, I see a roughly symmetrical shape. Now, is it perfect? No. Uh, explicitly, that part right there, that top of the bar, that's kind of making it harder to say it's perfectly symmetrical. But other than that, this looks pretty good. It's definitely not skewed heavily in one direction over another. So what that means, I'll say here, that since the data is roughly symmetrical, we would say that the mean is a better representation of the data set than the median. Now you may be asking, well wait, you said earlier for symmetric data that the mean and the median are approximately equal. So why does it matter which one I use? Why can I not just use either of them? Theoretically, that, that's true. You could use either of them because they are approximately the same. Um, however, the mean is going to be a lot more appropriate because it does include all the rest of the data and that it takes away that disadvantage uh, that the median had. So since we don't have the disadvantage for the mean because there is no extreme values really influencing the data that much, then that means that the mean in this case only has advantages. And even if they're slightly different, the mean is gonna be better for our calculation purposes. All right. Now we have one more question and this is just going over the concept of mean yet again. 
A manager of a car dealership recorded the number of automobile sales for the month by 20 of his employees. However, one of the values is no longer readable. If the mean number of sales by all employees was 27 and the mean of the 19 readable sales is 28, what is the number of sales by the unreadable employee? All right. Well, this is a little bit of a complicated question. In order to find this, we need to think about how you would calculate the mean. Um, so let's say for, I'll, I'll have two different sections here. I'll have first how you would calculate for all employees. So all employees and then the partial list. Now this happens pretty often where just sometimes a number will disappear. It even happens for teachers when grading. Sometimes a number will disappear and we need to do a little bit of backtracking to try to figure out what number uh, that was. Uh, it says if the mean number of sales for all employees was 27 and he has 20 employees. Well what that means is that he added up all the individual values divided by 20 and that resulted in a mean of 27. Otherwise known as he added up all the values, so like x sub 1 plus x sub 2, so I'll say x sub 1 is the first person, second person, third person, on and on, up to the 20th person, and divided that by 20. Whereas for the partial list, the partial list had a mean of 28, and he found that by doing x1 plus x2, the full data set up to 19 and divided that by 19 because that's how you would find the mean for just 19 values. Well if we do a little bit of work, work here um, I can multiply both sides by 20 on this top one and I can multiply the bottom or the both sides by 19 for the partial list. If I do 20 times 27 that will give me uh, 54 for 100, 540, and that's the sum of x plus 1 up to 20. And then if I do 19 times 28, I get 532, and that's the sum of everything up to 19. Well, if I know all the values up to 19 is 532, then that means I can take this part, which is the sum of everything up to 19, and replace that with 532. Therefore, this equation becomes 540 equals 532 plus my missing number. Subtract 532 from both sides, and I get a value of 8 for my missing number. That took a little bit more algebra than you may be used to in this course, and we don't do that as much. But this is a, a way of finding missing values like that, making sure you're understanding how means interact and how you can calculate them. So if you know what the mean was and how many values are, you should at least be able to backtrack to find what the sum of all the values are. All right. Now with that said, that's everything for 3.1, talking about how to measure the center. Notice that we focus mostly on the mean and the median, and we just barely mention the mode. The mode is not going to be useful too much. Um, the mean and the median are going to be the most important part. So make sure you know how to calculate those and work with one very stats to do so. Uh, with that said, that's everything for 3.1. So go ahead and try the homework for section 3.1, and I hope you have a nice day.